Um, so uh, in terms of questions, uh, you can pose questions on the Twitter hashtag that you ha we have been using for the entire series, R4, numerical 4, D series, R4, D series, uh, on Twitter, or by emailing us directly at uh, research at soas.ac.uk, research at soas .ac.uk. And Alex will be you know, noting down all the questions and the comments to make sure we don't miss any. Um, so today's webinar is part of the series Research for Development uh, that was set up by Oxford and uh, SOAS uh, late uh, last year uh, to more systematically interrogate ethical and practical questions that emerge in development-oriented research informed by decolonial reflexivity and primarily motivated by the emergence of funds such as the Global Challenges Research Fund and the Newton Fund that seem to have bridged you know, development practice with development research. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we recognize the hierarchies that have existed in knowledge production and the material asymmetries in research development and funding. So we wanted to set up uh, this session uh, in particular and have a more critical and reflective discussion on the concept of safeguarding, but what it means to deploy it and use it internationally. Um, and, you know, what would be the most appropriate approaches to safeguarding uh, internationally and especially in low and middle income uh, countries who have tended to be an, at the receiving end of international development theory. Um, safeguarding usually refers to provisions for the protection of children and groups uh, who are considered vulnerable uh, to sexual abuse and other forms of exploitation. And it is undoubtedly uh, the product of, um, you know, issues, sexual abuse and exploitation uh, problems that have faced uh, the NGO humanitarian and um, peace building sector in particular. Uh, I believe it became especially salient in 2018 with the, with the Oxfam Haiti scandal. Uh, and it triggered, I believe, a, a sector-wide sort of response to, to revamp or rethink the way in which the sector deals with allegations of sex, sexual abuse. As such, it's not a, a concept that has been used uh, in most low and middle income countries uh, that are targeted you know, in these development programs. But it, it is increasingly becoming a standard criterion for international development ethics and good practice. Uh, you know, and it's being used by funding bodies, NGOs, academic institutions. Uh, DFID in particular, uh, the International Development uh, Department in the UK has been uh, particularly influential in promoting safeguarding. Uh, there was a summit in 2018 when commitments were made by these different groups and sectors to really promote safeguarding objectives within organizations. And I think uh, the, uh, the penetration of safeguarding in academic in higher education institutions has been accelerated again by the GCRF fund and the Newton fund and other ODA related funding. So obviously there are multiple ethical questions that we're having at this point, which is I believe is an important point uh, of how we use this concept and, and uh, how we move forward. Um, you know, given its historical roots, uh, one might fear that, again, transposing it internationally as a standard could replicate unintentionally, you know, the existing historical top-down um, colonial tendencies in this field, whereby Western countries, again, tell other MIC countries how they should do things. Um, so I think it is an imperative at this time to ensure that local researchers, stakeholders, and communities, to the extent possible, are involved in discussing uh, safeguarding, what it means, and how, uh, what it should translate into practice in their local context. Um, and I've also observed that the current definitions of safeguarding have increasingly uh, subsumed ethical issues uh, and issues of you know, material inequalities in research practice, which we have tried to address as part of our research uh, reflexivity uh, work, um, which again seems to raise a question of you know, where do we draw the line between safeguard safeguarding and ethical issues? and uh, how without reducing the one into the other and losing you know the importance of each and uh, you know how should universities in particular deal with safeguarding without ending up taking a checklist approach which oftentimes happens when we respond to fund funder requirements so in this vein uh, you know we wanted to apply critical lens to the conversation by taking a, a closer look at what harm means, what vulnerability means, how we can uh, conceptualize those and explore how researchers working internationally uh, can better protect children and other groups uh, in the context they work in, and then look at the implications of the pandemic for these discussions. So we have a highly informed and diverse panel to pursue these objectives today. Uh, we have with us Dr. Kweku Akom, uh, 
um, a human development advisor at DFID. His portfolio includes looking into safeguarding issues uh, primarily in the health sector of international development. He previously worked as a senior health advisor with International Medical Corps UK, as health advisor for Merlin UK, and held various international positions with MSF. He has extensive knowledge and experience in international development and global health through his work, uh, which spans more than 20 countries, may, mainly in the global south, and over more, uh, 18 years experience in the aid sector. So, quite cool. It is lovely to have you today and, and hear your thoughts. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Romina, and uh, very, very uh, glad to be part of this uh, important discussion. Um, thank, thank you so much. I'm going to introduce the other speakers and then I'll return to you, Kweku. Is that okay? All right, that's fine. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Leona Vaughan. Uh, Leona, did I pronounce that well? Yes, <laughs> great. Who is a Derby Fellow under the Slavery and Unfree Labour Research theme at the University of Liverpool. Her work focuses on anti-colonial methods and methodologies which center minoritized groups in research, including safeguarding in research practice. She's also research director and co-author of the UK Collaborative Development Research, or UKCDR, uh, Safeguarding Guidance uh, in International Research and Report. Uh, Leona, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for finding the time. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Leona. Um, and uh, next we have, we're delighted to have Professor Alex Kanyimba, um, who is joining us from Namibia currently. He's so Associate Professor and Deputy Director at the Center for Research and Publications at the University of Namibia. He recently visited SUAS, in fact, as a STORM Fellow, uh, which aimed to promote mutual learning and capacity building in research development across institutions internationally. And he also was a speaker at uh, our event last year, which applied a decolonial lens to research uh, practice and funding. So, Alex, it's great to reunite with you almost a year later. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you so much for, for the invitation <laughs> to the event and thanks for having me. Yes, we tried to reconnect with you at a previous event and it didn't work. I was desolated. Yeah. desolated. Yes. Actually, there was just, I don't know, maybe some of these uh, errors of, uh, you know, internet and connections and, and so forth. But I could, I, could, I, I, was, I could see you that time. Just <laughs> that you, you didn't recognize that I was there. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's the technicalities. Yeah. We're still trying yeah. to navigate yeah. the, the virtual world. And I'm right. not very good at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. So good to have you, Alex. And last but certainly not least, we have our dedicated governance and ethics officer who has been advising SOAS also on issues of safeguarding, Khalid Hassan. Uh, Khalid has supported SOAS on research ethics and issues of governance since August 2018. Uh, he previously had a decade, uh, a decade accumulated experience working at the civil servants in the legal aid agency of the Ministry of Justice. Uh, he's a truly informed inter interlocutor in the more legal aspects of safeguarding. I'm truly pleased to have Khalid join us with us. Khalid, thank you for being here today. We've, we've tried to get you many times before. <laughs> Most, most welcome, very kind. <laughs> Thank you, Khaled, so good. Lovely, so I'll jump into the conversation. Um, I'll start with Kweku, if that's okay. So Kweku, um, DFID has been key in promoting safeguarding protocols, you know, with the summit in 2018 and the commitments that DFID and other organizations made. Uh, could you tell us a bit of how DFID understands, you know, vulnerable groups and harm and what preventing harm means in the sector? Um, and what, how has DFID engaged with existing legal frameworks in the countries you work with? Because obviously there are uh, diverse uh, policies in place and, and, you know, that alignment hasn't happened necessarily. So I'll pass the word to you, Kweko. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Romina. And uh, once again, thanks for having me. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, listening online, uh, wherever you are, or good morning or good evening. Um, now, a, a couple of remarks uh, with, with, with DFID and, and safeguarding. Uh, so as most of you may be aware, um, uh, there was this, if you like, uh, attention drawn to the issue of safeguarding, and I'll come to what safeguarding means in a minute, um, through reports that uh, we had in the beginning of 2018 of what happened in, in Haiti, uh, and other locations. Uh, however, it, it must be said that uh, issues of, uh, if you like, uh, sexual abuse and uh, exploitation in the aid sector 
has been going on for years and years now. Um, and there have been, I feel like, various uh, attempts to try to address it. 2018, when it, 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 it came out in the press, it, it was quite difficult because the, some of the key actors involved were, if you like, directly being funded by DFID and um, they were, if you like, key partners to DFID. So it was quite a, a big issue in the press. So at that time, DFID made a, a, a conscious effort that, okay, this is, I think, uh, if you like, a time to really look at these safeguarding issues in the A sector and try to stop it out. Because, of course, if you have these issues, it affects everybody. It, it affects everybody, right from the survivor through to uh, the community in general that we are trying to support, uh, through to the, if you like, the, um, the credibility of the, of the A sector as a whole. So it's something that as a sector, I think at that time, everybody agreed that, yes, I think we need to do something very concrete and specific in addressing it. Hence, uh, the different investment into it and then some of the uh, things you alluded to about the, about the uh, if you like the summit that we uh, we, we uh, undertook, and then uh, if you like uh, others making commitment, etc. Mm -hmm. So at the back of that, DFID, we took the if you like the word safeguarding. Now safeguarding uh, means a lot of things to a lot of people. Okay, here in the UK, safeguarding started as if you like safeguarding children as part of protecting the children, children's uh, protecting children's art, etc. So, but then in the, in the broader sense for DFID, it's mainly, if you like, uh, as you mentioned, Romina, uh, preventing harm uh, from happening. And that harm uh, could be, if you like, to, to people or also to the environment, okay? Now, the safeguarding here we are talking about for DFID, at the back of what happened in 2018, beginning of 2018, DFID formed what we call the safeguarding unit. And then that unit, our main, uh, remit is addressing safeguarding around sexual exploitation and sexual abuse and, and harassment. So every time you hear DFID, when this topic comes up, or even me right now, if you hear me using the word safeguarding, it's primarily referring to sexual exploitation and sexual harassment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but then of course, even that is quite different for different organizations. These organizations use different terms like misconduct or uh, ethical issues, as you rightly put, Romina. So sometimes there's a little bit of, if you like, uh, unclarity around some of the terms and some of the definitions. And how does that, this, how do these things uh, relate to, if you like, the populations and communities that we try to help? So I've been in, in places whereby you you talk about safeguarding and and sexual harassment and it's it sounds like a it's like a, a foreign definition, but then when you sit with communities and you, you talk about it uh, and then you put it in a, in a language that they understand, so of course it's a problem, because nobody wants to be touched if they don't want to be touched, whether the person is sitting in in uh, in the UK or, or sitting in South Sudan. But then the technology around this might be different. So therefore, looking at it from that angle, uh, those in the position of, if you like, working in these uh, communities like DFID and other organizations, in trying to address this problem in the air sector, we need to be very, very mindful of what it means for the local uh, people, local mm -hmm. populations, and what it means for somebody sitting here in London and try to bridge that, uh, if you like, uh, many uh, language. I will not say knowledge because it's not about knowledge because if you sit with the communities and you describe what we mean by safeguarding or misconduct, then it becomes very clear what, what it is about. And of course, we also have to take into account the so social environment in these communities, okay? For example, you have communities whereby, let's say you have uh, early child marriages whereby uh, children as, as young as 14 are married off to, to men as old as their grandfather, for example. Mm -hmm. And in such environment, addressing sexual exploitation becomes difficult because where, where do you draw the line? And then in that, in that sense, 
as you rightly put it, the environment in that community becomes very difficult for organizations like DFID or others working to try to address this problem. So where do you address this problem? Mm -hmm. And if you like engaging local authorities, local communities is quite important in that process. And as you said in your opening remarks, Romina, we haven't completely bridged that gap yet. Mm -hmm. However, for organizations like DFID, we, as much as we would like to bridge that uh, space between, uh, if you like, uh, international standards and local, uh, what is happening locally, we still need to plow on. We still need to make the effort to try to resolve the issue. So therefore, DFID, we take the approach of using international standards and using international definitions, okay? So mm -hmm. for example, uh, age of consent, okay? We at DFID, we use the international definition of age of consent, which is 18 years or below, or anybody below 18 years. If we have to do it, uh, according to the local standard, it's good work, but that would take a lot of work, which we are still continuing to do, etc. Even in the UK here, the age of consent is 16 years, but still different. We still maintain that we are using the international definition from the UN, which is the <laughs> United Nations, to try to work our way through these complex uh, issues. So, in as much as you could say that for some of the communities, some of the discussion may sound like Western. Once you bridge the language and, and try to bring it down to the, the local way of looking at things, then it becomes very, very clear that, yeah, nobody wants to be touched, whether they are in a camp in Lebanon or they are in Namibia or they are in Norway. No one wants to be touched if they are not ready to be touched. It's as simple as that. And we in the aid sector, we should try as much as possible, uh, taking into account, if you like, the uh, international standards and, and local dynamics, we should try to avoid these things happening in the aid sector. And then my last point I'll touch on before I'll uh, hand over, you touch on vulnerabilities, okay? So who is vulnerable, okay? And this, this uh, I'll not call it debate, but for me, it's, it's more like a discussion that's been going on for some time now. So in some circles, you hear that, oh, women are vulnerable. And then I will have been in discussions whereby the, the women then will say, why, why do you say I'm vulnerable? I'm not vulnerable. Who say a woman is vulnerable? <laughs> yes, exactly. So the, the fact that you are a woman doesn't make you necessarily vulnerable. However, the environment you find yourself in, that may put you at a disadvantage. And then that disadvantage becomes your vulnerability. So therefore, we need to be very, uh, if you like, uh, uh, cognizant of some of the words we use and, and who decide who is vulnerable uh, as some of uh, your points. I'm sure other panelists will, will touch on this, who decide who is vulnerable. So for example, internationally is, is agreed that, for example, children in quote are vulnerable. Why? Because children have no agency. They are just children, so they need protection. But then when it comes to, uh, to adults, uh, for example, if you say that in some circumstances, somebody who is displaced mm -hmm. is vulnerable. Why are they vulnerable? Because they are in the position of disadvantage and that disadvantage makes them vulnerable. So who decides that? Well, you could argue that, okay, those of us working in the aid sector, trying to help these groups may want to define and then through that definition, try to channel where uh, the scarce resources should go. But once again, there's a process, in my opinion, which will be done together with the local authorities. We, in the aid sector, we hear a lot of uh, assessment, assessment, assessment. That assessment should also look at what, uh, if you like, where the most, the most need is. And then through that, come up with equitable distribution or, or distribution of the resources, that will be fair. Now, if in that process, we come to a conclusion that, for example, people uh, with disabilities who are displaced are the most indeed, and therefore, in quote, get the label as the most vulnerable, then for me, as far as they get the support they need, then I wouldn't be bogged down about the term vulnerable or vulnerability. You know what I mean? Yes. So as, as long as the process of getting to that point is done in the right way, and the resources for those uh, that are in that needy position, are getting to that uh, to those people 
for me, that is mm -hmm. all it is about. It's about we all trying to support people who are in, if you like, less fortunate position than us. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Kwaku. Thank you so much. Um, we, we, are, we have to be uh, conscious of time, but you know, we were listening so carefully to all your points because uh, I think you contextualize the matter very well. And I think you pointed to a very important issue that it's not about uh, not being committed to protecting uh, well-being and, and people's integrity, wherever they are, whoever they are. It's how we do it, is the process, right? And I think you spoke about the translation process, not in term linguistic translation only, but conceptual translation. Uh, how, how can we uh, convey to the, the, our interlocutors in LMIC in, a, in any context that is not necessarily our context, what we mean? And then how do we ensure that we get to a definition that everyone resonates with? So it's not our definition, but it's uh, also the definition. It's something that everyone contributes to, I guess. Uh, so I think this is a nice segue to Leona, who is our next speaker. Kweko, do stay on the line because we, we do have a Q&A at the end. Um, so, Leona, uh, obviously you were part of the UK CDR uh, guidance, uh, which has, uh, has been um, you know, very influential. I think people have been using it very, very useful uh, in these conversations. And I think I should uh, just briefly mention that this was uh, co-authored and co-produced, right? It was um, uh, uh, the result of an international consultation. Uh, led by the uh, delivery team at the University of Liverpool. And, and I, sh I, I would like to acknowledge the co-authors, Professor Alex Bolch, Dr. Sureka Garimella, Dr. Bintu Mansarai, uh, Linnea Renton, MPH, Adriana Smith, MPH, and of course, you, Leona. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd like to acknowledge everyone because I, I wish we could have everyone here, but uh, you're today's spokesperson. Um, so, so Leona, uh, you know, I put some questions to you earlier of, you know, how the, you know, sort of the insights of the guidance in, in, in uh, having those consultations and again about the concept and how people understand it, uh, especially around the concept of harm. And I know you have slides. So do you want me to put up the slides? Uh, not just yes, I think what I'll just do is just give everyone a brief uh, background as well to, to myself and the actual consultation, if that's okay, Romina. Yeah. Um, yes, so I think it's important for me to outline sort of my researcher positionality in terms of um, how I approach safeguarding and risk. Um, and, you know, it, echoing what Quaker has said, you know, safeguarding is primarily a Western concept, a Western term, um, although it's not in terms of the practice, mm -hmm. um, but the terminology, the language is very much Western. Um, and in the UK in particular, which my background is, um, my research background has been in, it's very much focused on compliance and is policy and process driven. Um, so rather than a way of working, which is what the UK CDR guidance and report really advocates for, um, safeguarding within the UK context is, is very much a different thing. And I think the other problematic aspect to safeguarding is that quite often it tries to prioritize risk prevention as if it can be guaranteed. Um, rather than risk mitigation and anticipation and trying to um, address risk. Um, and sometimes that can come across as, white, as quite pathologizing because from my perspective, in terms of risk and the power to define risk, it is riddled with um, preconceptions and it is racialized and it is gendered and it is classed and it is all of those things. Um, so I think the other aspect as well to, to flag up is that victims and survivors of safeguarding um, problems are very often not centralised in the frameworks to address them. So that was something that was uppermost in my mind. Um, and like I said before, there is the colonial logic to risk in terms of it's a way of othering and controlling and imposing our own standards on others. Um, so with all of those things in mind, when I put together the, um, the proposal to UKCDR to undertake that work, it was very much on the basis of the way that we did the research would, be, would also be as, just as important as what we found. And that's why the collaboration and the partnerships with um, co-researchers within the Global South was really, really important and really central to the work that we did. Um, so that just sort of gives context. And I think um, the first slide, Ramina, really is talking mm -hmm. about harm. Um, and like has already been said, you know, safeguarding is not just about protecting children and those thought of or assumed to be vulnerable. Um, it's actually about the avoidance of harm. Um, and ag again, you know, sort of, it's not a guaranteed um, thing. We cannot avoid all harm. 
Um, but we can certainly consider it, anticipate it, plan for it and, and, and put in things in place mm -hmm. to respond to it appropriately, but also to, to try and mitigate um, harms that maybe we have no control over. So it should, in, in this circumstance, um, I don't know whether you want to share the, the screen, um, that um, it should consider the rights of participants, of researchers and wider communities to not be harmed by research or through the research process. Um, and that very much is, is, the, is what we centred on in terms of um, making sure that people understood that when we talked about harm, we weren't just talking about sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, which had been the priority, that we were also talking about the broader forms of violence, exploitation and abuse, which can include um, many things, including bullying and physical violence, but also structural and symbolic harm and violence, including financial exploitation. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important um, aspect of, of the work. So, um, but even with the things that maybe seem more, um, more direct, more, more sort of um, clear cut, like sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment. Um, there is obviously still nuance to this in terms of consensual sexual relationship dynamics between junior and senior researchers or researchers and participants once research is over. Um, so the point is it's about the power dynamic within these situations. Um, so like I say, in terms of structural and symbolic violence, um, we very much wanted to make sure that that was within our understanding of safeguarding. Um, and so that the, the actions that can cause harm, but can't always be personalized in, a, in terms of responsibility or can't always be seen, um, are just as important as, as, as things that can be personalized and responsabilized within the research process. Um, and just to sort of, as a reminder, the guidance that we wrote is for the research councils and research institutions, um, based in the UK, but operation internationally. Um, so if I just move on to the, the next screen, um, we deconstructed the draft principles that UK CDR had originally um, put together through David Orr and his team in 2018 for the survey, for the very reasons that we talked about in terms of safeguarding being um, a term, a, a form of language that isn't widely understood. Um, but we also wanted to drill down in terms of what were the issues about praxis um, so we undertook a survey of researchers internationally. We interviewed, we, we surveyed 555 uh, respondents from all over the world. And that, that um, uh, diagram there gives an idea of where people were from. We were really pleased that we got quite a really, you know, a, a decent response from the global south. Um, and I think that part of that was the fact that we undertook the survey in English, Spanish and French. Um, so that, that survey was, was really important in terms of we got a good volume of feedback um, and feedback from people who were operating in, in a variety of settings. So not only civil society um, organisations who often are research partners or research gatekeepers, um, NGOs, research institutions, but across a wide variety of locations um, of lower and middle income countries. So in addition to that survey, we undertook 15 key informant interviews in West Africa, South Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and they were undertaken by our, our research partners in those regions. Um, and we, we also undertook some group discussions at events in Ghana, in Kenya, Tanzania and the UK. Um, and I think it's important as well to acknowledge here that we, we adapted the phrase preventing and addressing harm in international research um, rather than safeguarding um, to reflect that the fact that you know safeguarding has little meaning in other languages and contexts and just as an example in the next slide um, this was borne out by what we found so this is just a, a, a quote from one of the respondents that the term doesn't translate well into Arabic it means something like providing a financial guarantee um, and so in their practice they talk more about respecting and taking care of each other rather than listing the various types of harm that it's possible to inflict. And this um, word cloud as well just shows how many different terms that people said that they used instead of safeguarding. So we can see that safeguarding encompasses a huge variety of um, practice. So it's not that it's not happening within lower and middle income countries, it's just that the, the, the term was not one that was being used. Mm 
Um, and if we just move on to the next slide as well, I think that, um, so I think that, sorry, what I wanted to say there is also about how risk can be ethnocentrically imagined. Um, so, you know, it's not always from the perspective of the people who could be harmed. It's usually from the perspective of the people who are trying to impose something to stop harm from happening. Um, and when that's a UK and uh, an international dynamic, then that is obviously riddled with power dynamics um, and particular standpoint issues. Um, so these were some of the, th the things that uh, researchers came up with as alternatives for safeguarding. And the most popular was participant protection. Um, but again, you know, it, it just speaks to the fact that there's a lot of different terminologies that are being used right across um, not only the global north, but also the global south in terms of actions to prevent and address harm. So our position was very much that risk, harm and vulnerability should be self-identified. It should be self-determined right throughout the process of anticipating, mitigating and addressing real and potential harm in research. Um, and not imposed from the outside or through a Western lens. Um, and the four guiding principles that we um, developed, which is on the, the next slide, Romina, mm -hmm. um, capture the feedback from participants in terms of how they think safeguarding should be done. Um, so it should be un underpinned by the rights of survivors um, and whistleblowers and victims. It should be underpinned by equity and fairness, transparency, accountability, and good governance. Um, but what we also did within the, within the guidance was that um, we broke down safeguarding into three main areas for action. Um, yeah, so um, that, that um, that's okay, Ramina is the previous okay. slide, so that's fine. Um, and within that um, advocating for a victim survivor centers approach um, is that researchers, participants and wider communities were perceived as all of them as potential victims. So there was no idea or hierarchy about vulnerability. It is thinking about the potentiality of harm. Um, and we tasked everyone within the research process to be proactive. Um, and I think that just the little quote that is next to that in terms of uh, preventing means avoiding. And in order to avoid, you have to be able to anticipate and you can't see something that you don't have the mindset for. That was someone within the Latin American region who was talking about actually, if you don't understand the risks that we face, how can you even possibly try to prevent them? Is that okay? Oh yes. Um, is uh, is this the end? Yeah, Anna? this is just um, for for the later part of the discussion. Lovely. Okay, I can put it aside. Lovely. So we're back back to our speakers. That was that was fascinating. I was nodding all throughout. Thank you so much, Leona, for uh, really taking us through that journey. And and I truly appreciate that because I've had this uh, debate with myself. You know, you don't you don't want to promote a narrative, and you don't want to be a you don't want to work for organizations that you know are implicated in these hierarchies. But if you don't work with these organizations, you can't change practice. You can't. You know, I've, I've been in this sector, so I have the same sort of struggles within myself. So thank you so much for doing that, because I think it was well done, uh, inclusive to the extent possible, uh, given the circumstances. Um, and we'll go back to that. I'm, uh, I think um, I'm actually, I think you raised some in really interesting points again about these different definitions and understandings. And evidently there are, uh, people are taking measures to protect and to prevent harm. And I'd like to invite Alex Kanyimba, who is joining us from Namibia, uh, to tell us a bit, Alex, you know, you're obviously involved with the university and I wonder uh, if you have something in place in the university for, for uh, foreign researchers and local researchers when they go into communities uh, and also how you see this concept from your positionality, from, from where you're, you're located. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts generally on, on everything we've said so far. Okay, you want me to put uh, to... I can put the slide. Would you yeah, like yeah, me so, to? Yeah, it's, it's actually ideal if I can go through my, my slides. Uh, Lovely. So I'm going to just send you the right ones. Yes, I have them. They are, they okay. should be showing soon. Yep. Can you see them? Uh, Alex? That, yeah, that's actually the right one. Yes. Um, that's actually me. I'm an associate professor of education for sustainable development at the University of Namibia. 
and deputy director at the Center for Research and, and Publication. We can go to the next one. Um, this is actually what I'm going to talk about uh, in, the, in my presentation, the, those points. And then uh, we go to, we can go to the next one because, uh, okay, it, we, 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 this is the definition which I've actually borrowed from, from you because we don't have uh, that definition um, in, our, in our research ethics policy. So of course, uh, I've just taken from you and then, but somehow it's captured. If you go to the next uh, slide, uh, I'll show you that uh, it's a new concept to us, but uh, in one way or another, it's captured in our research ethics policy. Uh, when I was going through my, our research ethics policy, I saw the, in guideline 11, where it says the investigator must, must, must secure safeguards of the confidentiality of participants' research data. This is actually how it's just in passing, not actually in, in detail. And um, we actually, uh, Namibia has got uh, one, uh, we have got these uh, special groups of people that is over Himba and also the Sun, who actually are refusing to change. And uh, this is, has been the source of international attraction for researchers. And then the health wise, they are okay. They are not westernized. But a lot of researchers have been coming to do our research and the study on the Ovahimba, including the children. And what they, are, they are relatively healthy compared to all the other, you know, and they live longer con compared to all other uh, uh, Namibian people. So this, this is actually one of the areas where we've been experiencing uh, difficulties with the international researchers in Namibia. So we can, we can move on to the next one. So where you, we, we put in place as safeguarding in one or another, and we consider children as a, a, a vulnerable group and they need safeguarding because of the development, developmental age. They may lack ability to understand concepts. They are under the authority of others, parents, guardians, and teachers. They can be easily coerced, and they are not, um, uh, may not uh, relatively or absolutely in, um, incapable of protecting their own interest. So this is actually why we consider them to be a vulnerable group and they need uh, our um, protections at the, the, through research at the University of Namibia. We, let's move to the next one. Uh, so they are vulnerable and we understand is that an, an, an ability to provide informed or voluntary consent, exposure to something which can cause injury or undesirable, they can be exposed to attack. They may incur social, economic, legal, psychological, and physical harm. So this, well, because of that, we consider them to be um, uh, vulnerable and they need uh, safeguarding. We, will, we can move to the next one. Next slide. Uh, this is our model that we use. We actually base our ethical review process through this concept called utilitarianism, which is a theory that determines right from wrong by focusing on outcomes, is the type of consequentialism. Utilitarianism holds that the most ethical study is the one that will produce the extreme good for the greatest number of the children. Simply stated, the benefits for the study must outweigh the risks. So this, we, we base our ethical review on, on that uh, important uh, concept. And uh, we, we can move on to the uh, to other uh, slides. So when, when our, we do the research, uh, the ethical review process, we follow some of these international you know, uh, documents and guidelines, the, the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki, the Bellman Report, the National Institute of Health. You go on to the next one. I'm sure you are familiar with these ones. Then the, the World Health Organization's operational guidelines for ethics, for ethics committees that review biomedical research, the Council for International Organization of Medical Sciences, international ethical guidelines for biomedical research involving human subjects. Those are the international uh, documents that we look at when we, we undertake the review. The next slide. Um, so specifically to children, there are some of these regulations that we put in place. Um, that is now the, the CFR 46, 
subparts A and D. And then uh, the, the other one, uh, CFR 50 and 56, as it relates to children. And there's also the NIH, uh, the NIH policy and guidelines on the inclusion of children as participants in research, the special protection for children as research subjects. So we, we draw some of the ideas from these uh, regulations as we undertake the ethical review process for the researchers at the University of Namibia and those who participate, you know, who are involved in some kind of, uh, you know, bilateral or partnership with the University of Namibia researchers. We move to the next one. Um, in terms of the national guidelines uh, at the university, we ensure that uh, researchers that come in Namibia must register with the National Commission for Research Science and Technology. We ensure that there is a memorandum, memorandum of understanding uh, specifying the patents, the IPs, the benefit sharing, etc. And then uh, the material transfer agreement, because we have got this problem of, uh, you know, taking saliva, blood samples to Europe, and uh, you know, in some other, even plant plant material. Uh, so we, the, the, the must be the, these are uh, the, the researchers need to comply to the material transfer uh, agreements and also the access benefit agreements where the, you know, the members of the community, including the children, should actually benefit from that particular study um, in one way or another. And uh, the, the committee system that we put in place at the university, we have these four, uh, actually five. There's HREC NH, which is a uh, human research ethics, um, non-health. So that is now high risk studies involving children. And then we have um, human research ethics committee, health related studies, that high risk studies involving children. We've got ad hoc re research ethics committee, that's a low risk studies. This committee is not allowed to review studies that involve children because we consider that the level of training for that committee is not as very high compared to the, the first two. Okay, the ARAG is about the animals, and then the ARAG is about the, 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 the environment uh, and the engineering research ethics committee. So we put these in place in order to ensure, you know, the, the principle of safeguarding, which is guideline 11 in, in, in our policy. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, some of the aspects that we consider uh, is assent and uh, uh, the child's indications. Uh, assent means that um, the child's uh, legal representative or the guardian or the parent must actually understand what is going to happen to the child, uh, must understand uh, whether the child can agree or not agree from the study and the language is appropriate that is going to be used and, and so forth. And of course, um, and then the child, the, 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 the legal representative or the child must give uh, an assent, must authorize that, that the child can participate in the study. And we refer to that concept of assent. Then informed consent, that's where we have uh, the child also signing and of course, um, you know, the, the, the guardian also signing uh, to ensure that the, the, the child is participating in the study and they uh, should uh, uh, understand what is expected of the child and um, whether the, the child has got uh, the knowledge to participate in such kind of study. So with the, the child um, protection and well-being, that uh, in one or another, they must be, the child must be protected uh, during the study. The, what kind of assistance should be given to the child as he is in, uh, uh, participating in the study, whether he can, the child can withdraw, or if the, if the study is becoming too complicated, the study, the child must, uh, must uh, 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 the study should be suspended. Okay, and of course, uh, the minimum risks or harm, of course, uh, the idea is that uh, the study 
uh, as other speakers have mentioned, that it should possess no more than minimal risks. Of course, there'll be risks uh, for participating in the study. So this, the, actually the researchers should ensure, the researchers are charged with the responsibility to ensure that the, 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 the risks to the child are minimal. And then of course, the last point is the, the after, you know, after the study, the issue of, uh, you know, data processing, processing the data, uh, the data protection laws, and then information about research uh, results. Uh, so that um, the issue of uh, agreeing that, uh, you know, maybe pseudonyms or false names should actually be uh, uh, published in the particular uh, study. So that confidentiality aspect is very much important during the, you know, um, the, the publication. And of course, uh, it's required that uh, at one point, the researchers must come back to the research participants to share them the actually the actual results of the study, so that uh, you know what was promised during the data collection is uh, actually ad ad adhered to. So, in um, in short, these are some of the important ethical considerations that we normally uh, 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 look at when a study is enacted uh, through the University of Namibia. Uh, in partnership with the other researchers from other uh, countries. And uh, my, my last slide is about the implications for UK discussions on self, um, the, on self, um, self guarding. It's always actually important to identify groups whose participation in the, in the study may require additional protection. There's a need to, uh, there's a need to, to develop and recommend mecha mechanism to ensure that vulnerable populations are appropriately included and uh, protected in research. The training requirements is very important for our reviewers uh, so that um, they have to look at some of the things that the researchers should do, observe when they are collecting data. And um, we also recommend that um, res uh, the, the research offices, uh, like I come from, the off from our office is responsible for ethical clearance. And part of the problem that we often encounter is that uh, we, are, we often come at the end of, uh, of the research cycle. You know, when, when the research is, being, is about to take off, that's when we are being approached to uh, assist with the review. So we recommend that we should get involved as early as possible. And in terms of the funders, the Euro um, American funders, uh, sometimes, um, you know, researchers come, uh, especially internationally from these advanced countries, and, uh, you know, they will transfer um, genetic material, they transfer saliva, blood samples, uh, plants, without, uh, you know, um, agreements. So, uh, of course, uh, some of those who are in the, the, fund, the, the funders really need to take that into account because is usually the source of uh, uh, confrontation. And the other, um, the, um, the other issue is this one of, uh, in terms of benefits, because you know the borders of Africa, uh, you, uh, you know you just cut, you know this, the, the Berlin conference uh, is the one that cut uh, the borders uh, of, of in, in Africa. And they were cutting people who are related. So for example, in Southern Africa, you find the sun people. In, in South Africa, in Botswana, in Namibia. But um, where there was a study that was done, uh, but the, the sun, it's, on, it's only the sun people in South Africa who is benefiting from the knowledge of the sun people, because there's actually one of these uh, plant material which helps prevent uh, obesity. Um, and there's huge amounts of uh, money that, that is actually collecting internationally. But uh, who is benefiting from that? It's only the sun people in South Africa. So the sun people in uh, Botswana, they don't benefit. And those in Namibia are not benefiting. So actually this need to be ensured uh, because it's actually a source of uh, uh, conflict. Even at the moment, maybe it's still, uh, it's gonna, uh, it's, it's still under discussion. So 
Uh, so the the last point is uh, uh, Euro American funders to ensure adherence to national guidelines for research on vulnerable population. I mentioned, I think uh, Leona mentioned it that uh, this this financial exploitation, especially in uh, in uh, in our context, where uh, some of the researchers just go directly to the study population and give them a small incentive, a small amount of money in exchange for information from, from them. So it's actually important that uh, you know, when the researchers are coming to, to Africa, uh, really um, national guidelines should be taken into account so that uh, the conflicts are minimized, and harm is minimized. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, That's the, that was my last uh, slide. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Alex Kanimba. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's, it, it's such a comprehensive presentation. Thank you for putting so much effort to give us a sense of how you deal with ethics, with ethics reviews. Uh, and yeah. it, it shows a lot of care. Uh, obviously, you, you, it's a difference in terminology. And I yeah. appreciate what you said that you're in communication with the source office. And I think, you know, we've sort of learned from you. And I think we've shared with you what we do. Yeah. And I think that has been beneficial. Uh, we, which in fact brings me to um, our next speaker, Khalid Hassan, who is our governance and ethics officer. And, and, and I know Khalid and you, Alex, when you were last here at SOAS, were having conversations about yes. safeguarding, I think, specifically. Um, and, and I know, you know, obviously Khalid has been thinking about these issues, Alex as well, uh, Alex Lewis. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, we're always concerned of how to work with uh, local universities or, you know, universities in Africa, Asia, Middle East, where we work in. And, and then how to adapt our policies and approaches in, you know, in relation to the legal frameworks and the policies you have in place. So Khalid, may I ask, um, may I invite you to share your thoughts on how, you know, what have maybe what we have done so far and what do you think uh, we could do more to uh, sort of equip our researchers when they go into different contexts um, and how universities here in the UK could, uh, you know, could engage with safeguarding. Hello everyone, thanks Romina. Um, to be honest with you, on your latter point, I'm a little bit hesitant. I would be very reluctant to set out very prescriptive things for other universities, but what we found particularly at SOAS um, is the essentiality of embedding the safeguarding uh, concepts and process within the whole research ethics framework as an end-to-end -end process. We acknowledge and our researchers acknowledge at all different levels there is always going to be inherent tensions between, uh, as some of the previous speakers alluded to, what, for example, the UK framework, which is a very legalistic, safeguarding vulnerable persons act and other associated pieces of legislation, how we actually operate from that and then look at it within a wider international framework and then also bespoke for the countries where our researchers might be going to. And although it has been highlighted, while the vernacular of the language may not necessarily match what a UK, a, a highly regular, uh, 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 highly legalistic and regularized approach that is not necessarily to, uh, to be taken that those lower and middle income countries have no legislation on this or have no pre-existing frameworks so it's a very very delicate balancing act and I think a base point what we've learned at SOAS is that this is never a one-stop shop this is something which is constantly, ha which has to be revisited, something which has to be built upon. And the essentiality of building at the very, very earliest stages, uh, more informed and active relationships with the people which we're working with, particularly in terms of our partners. So when we look at how this is approached at SOA, some of the newer features which we've introduced within the research ethics process, and it's kind of a balance between, yes, something which is purely legalistic, but also something which takes into account what funder requirements are, because many funders now are saying, as part of the actual proposal, which is research proposal, which is submitted, identify the safeguarding and or child protection issues. And then funders like the EC 
which would have a slightly broader perspective to say that, well, actually vulnerable groups and populations are not just necessarily children under 18s, uh, people at risk of ex uh, uh, direct exploitation, but perhaps indirect exploitation for other categories of participants, for example, internally displaced persons, live asylum claimants, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've tried to do at the, at the very outset is to try and capture as quickly as possible at the proposal stage, are there any safeguarding and or broader related safeguarding issues that this potential research project may throw up? And then to reiterate what some of the other speakers have mentioned in this, it's not about being completely risk averse to say that there is a vulnerable or potentially vulnerable group or children involved in, in the research, therefore the research can't go ahead. No, that should never be the case. Rather, it should be very early identification, appropriate strategies and approaches to, okay, what potential risks do we initially anticipate? But then not having that frozen in time. So for, we have bigger research projects which run three, four, five years at a time, it's not about having that static to say, well, we've revisited, oh, sorry, we've, we've taken into account any particular safeguarding issues. It's done and dusted. We don't need to look at it again. It's an iterative process and it will be constantly changing and something which needs to be factored into three, six, nine month reviews. So it's so as authorization for uh, ethical approval which can involve children and or potentially vulnerable participant groups can only come from the Institutional Research Ethics Panel. A lower level uh, authorization is not acceptable but tied within that uh, because it's a legal requirement for the, for the UK is to have designated safeguarding leads and or deputy, uh, equivalent deputies. So within our particular processes, we have involved our DSL within this uh, process. So it's not just about, so as research ethics professionals looking at this and saying, well, okay, we, we, we give the initial authorization for the research to proceed, but it's also building in the review and input, which very often is invaluable from our own designated safeguarding lead. Just quickly turning to within the international context, particularly in terms of our partners, there can be, and I know, Romina, you've, you, you know, you've touched upon this extensively, there can be a perception that a particular university, whether it's us or anyone else, that we are almost transporting or transposing a highly technical legalistic framework or approach onto a low and middle income country. Um, some of the difficulties in navigating through that, one has been in terms of uh, vernacular and language, but also where what we're looking to do now is looking and seeing whether our partners, whether they be universities or NGOs, et cetera, do they have that existing framework? So they, do they have you know, it might be called something else. It might be a prevention of harm document. But do they have uh, bespoke frameworks and or equivalency with what we've got? And what we're looking to do going forward um, for particular projects is working with our partners to say that, okay, you know, you, you may have an existing framework, we have an existing framework, but because the research is taking place in country X, we will develop or we want to develop jointly with you a set of safeguarding protocols which will be bespoke and specific for this project because each project will you know invariably raise its own particular nuances and while we can and do um, within the sector have a broad approach with okay these are the generic issues there will be particular nuances for every research project which you know there, there may be new things, there may be things which don't apply, there may be very niche areas which are being covered, uh, in particular to do with a, a category of participant. So ideally moving forward, this is, this is something which we're particularly keen on working with to have bespoke protocols per project 
and that way we can hopefully and i'm not saying this is a this is going to be a done deal but hopefully by that way we can build in a what is the actual cultural sensitivities in the environment which we're working in b take actually take account of okay this country x what is its actual regulatory framework and how does that compare contrast with where we're coming from here and last as an element to that as well is to try and embed more training as i'm sure colleagues from across the sector know with the change in data protection laws everybody has had to do mandatory training for data protection one of the newer features which we have now is a safeguarding training module which is you know now becoming mandatory so where researchers are identifying at their proposal stage, you know, potentially I may have a vulnerable uh, participant group, there may be children involved, et cetera, et cetera. Tying mandatory training to that, formally looking at, okay, is, is, is an enhanced DBS required? Or if it's in an international context, an ICP, International Child Protection Certificate, in the countries which we're operating in, is there equivalency? Or is there something which is similar, which we can cover at both ends? And lastly, just to finish, I think with this area, because um, I come from a very formalistic, legalistic background, there can be a tendency to be a little bit um, inadvertently, and I think everyone does this, to be a little bit too rigid in terms of how we are looking at these kinds of things. And I think it's incredibly important that for all parties concerned, whether it's you know us as a research institution, our partners in other countries, and also research participants with particular uh, safeguarding areas or vulnerability, is that we do not have this as a one-stop shop, that we ha are constantly asking the difficult questions of ourselves, having those difficult conversations between us and our partners, and constantly looking and revisiting these things, because the moment we or any organization sits on its laurels and says, well, you know, we have an appropriate framework or we're covering or ticking all the boxes. I think that's where from that complacency, a lot of these difficulties can reemerge. And I think that, you know, be, being willing to challenge ourselves, you know, to have our partners challenge us and to build that reflexivity end to end, I think is absolutely crucial. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, thank you so much. Those are invaluable thoughts. And, uh, you know, we've had these conversations before and we, I think um, we, we understand the necessity of having this dialogical approach with our partners one to one. And, and you know, since uh, I think in the past year, we are trying to have that informal conversation going on. It's difficult, it's challenging. And I appreciate that you corrected me of not sounding prescriptive. And I think my intention was more of the kind of providing some uh, lessons that we've learned to other universities because we, we've, we have been in conversation with uh, many research managers and administrators and it's interesting that everyone is asking similar questions, right? And if we can share those lessons and not duplicate or, you know, try something that someone else has already tried, then I think we can all benefit from that. Um, thank you so much. This was, uh, this was invaluable and, um, and I think it, it's, it contextualizes the discussion. We, we can have a really interesting discussion uh, at the Q&A session and I realize we went over time. That is because we had some technical issues in the beginning and also because everyone uh, is, is, you know, everyone's presentations are so interesting. Uh, I also don't want to rush the conversation. So if the speakers are okay, we can extend a bit the session and since this is live stream, uh, of viewers can return to it any time. So I hope this is fine with everyone. Uh, uh, and, and I knew our intention was to touch a bit on the pandemic and how this might have changed a bit the situation or might add some other considerations we need to, to keep in mind. And I'd like to invite Leona, if that's okay to uh, Leona, because I know there was a separate guidance uh, for COVID-19 that was yeah. produced in ECDR. Maybe you want to speak on that or any other thoughts that you, you think are important. Yeah, um, well, like you say, we, um, when we were ready to publish the guidance and the report that we'd done for UKCDR, which was a really, really short piece of work, um, was just at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it would have been remiss of us to carry on with the publication without some form of acknowledgement that actually COVID-19 presented us 
with a whole different set of challenges um, and to some extent a continuation of, of existing challenges. Because um, I think, like I said before, you know, sort of in terms of the characteristics of international research and global north, global south power dynamics is that we have a history, whether we like it or not, of very extractive, exploitative uh, relationships in research where we, you know, we, we get all the credit for all the work that's been done in the global south within the global north. Um, and the COVID-19 situation, I think it not only revealed that those inequalities were still there, but actually it also revealed the potential and the potentiality for um, research institutions to actually exacerbate inequalities or even create new ones. Um, so I don't need to, to talk about specifics in terms of the French scientists who talked about uh, testing the vaccine in Africa before every, everywhere else, just for ease of accessibility. But we can see how um, harms in that, in that circumstance, particularly, are acutely put under the microscope in that those particular harms are not just individual harms, but actually structural in terms of perpetrating and perpetuating racist stereotypes around, you know, sort of how much consent or assent is needed for, for research in particular areas. So that companion piece really just elucidated some of the major, major issues um, that researchers needed to be vigilant about at that time. Um, so I don't know whether you can still access my presentation, Ramina, but um, it was just to say that Linnea Renton and I also wrote a, a short piece for the um, Discover Society, which talked about um, the very issues that um, that we've covered in terms of uh, this anti-colonial approach to to risk, harm, and vulnerability, um, but particularly at a time of COVID nineteen. So that's just really to, if people want to refer to that particular very short article that's online about safeguarding during a pandemic. Um, and I think what we tried to cover there as well was that in the rush to either deliver research to capture the COVID-19 experience and the COVID-19 moment, or in the rush to try and advance our understanding of the virus itself. Um, we don't want, well, we want to ensure that we don't ride roughshod over people's rights. Um, and so it's acutely important to make sure that responsibilities within existing research um, are very clear in respect of, of report and safeguarding concerns and that the processes are understood. So very much like what Callas was saying, um, you know, that the, the process should be understood, but also fairly distribu distributed across partners. You know, we shouldn't push this down to Global South partners that perhaps maybe are more involved in the, in the data collection um, rather than taking responsibility more so on, on the institutions um, and this is especially important in situations of constant change. Um, but what I've put together, Ramina, if, if it's useful, is on the next slide is um, some considerations for researchers. Um, and these were, you know, broadly already within the guidance, but I think especially, like I say, COVID-19 has brought it into, into sharp relief. Um, and I, I talk about... Um, especially because from personal experience as well of doing um, research into child labour um, in various lower and middle income countries, you know, these are the sorts of things that I wish I would have known at that time, um, but also some of the lessons that we picked up. So, you know, like all of the other speakers, talking about considerations from end to end, the entire process, um, and that started with your research questions, about thinking about whether your research questions could actually do harm. Um, so the, the design and the co-designing of the research idea, the research proposal and the research questions should be done with the risks that are identified informed by local knowledge and specific expertise. So, you know, researchers should be working with local experts to understand the context that you want to explore. You know, they should inform the risk assessments, um, like Alex mentioned, um, from their expertise, you know, I always find it quite unusual when people say they want to research a particular country that they know nothing about and they don't know what the context is. We should be avoiding those situations. Um, Co-development of research, and that includes the research methodology, the research methods. Um, so very much like we did with the UK CDR um, model that I created, you know, we didn't just decide what those methodologies would be or those methods would be. We, we co-created them to be appropriate for the context. And that's really, really important during the pandemic as well, because everybody's in different stages of the pandemic. Um, so particularly identifying fieldwork sites um, should be done with the risks, again, informed by local knowledge and expertise. 
In terms of, the, of delivery of research, um, a lot of stuff has gone online, obviously, which poses not only opportunities for maybe access to people um, that we wouldn't have accessed before, but also challenges in that certain people won't be able to access that, that medium. Um, so collaborating with research partners, gatekeepers and interpreters, for example, should be done in order to identify and link with, um, identify the most appropriate ways of doing the research and link with local appropriate support services for participants. Um, because also one of the things that is a current challenge within the COVID-19 context is that small organizations, small charities, CSOs, NGOs have lost funding and don't exist anymore. So if you continue to do your research with particular communities, they may not be able to access those support organizations that would have ordinarily been there. So you need to know who you can sign posts to. And finally is the issue about co-authorship with researchers and research partners and co-dissemination. So to really think about how potentially research partners or people that you've worked with in the research process can become invisibilized um, through the outputs of the research and trying to redress that and making sure that those people are visible. Um, and like I said before, you know, consideration of all of these things should help you to mitigate, you know, identify the harms, mitigate the harms, address any harms that occur. But, you know, even more importantly, and sometimes we're, we're reluctant to say this, they might actually decide that your research should not go ahead in the way that you've, you've, you've planned it. Thank you so much, uh, Leona. That's uh, very comprehensive. I've stopped sharing. And we, we run out of time, obviously, and I know some people will need to go soon. So I'd like to invite Alex Kinyimba, if you can add a few thoughts. Alex, uh, you know, currently in the pandemic, obviously has changed the situation locally as well. Um, you know, how are the researchers dealing with um, these kind of concerns in this time and if you have any other additional thoughts that you, you'd like to share. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think since the uh, onset of uh, the pandemic we have actually there have been some change even in terms of um, some ethical uh, considerations. We are uh, we expect uh, we've been expecting researchers to ex there had been actually a plethora of uh, research being undertaken on uh, on 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 COVID vis-à-vis um, -vis the, the population, the local population. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, from the research office, we have been actually asking them to explain how they are gonna deal with the, you know, the the issue of uh, the, the transmission, uh, where we've been actually a little bit uh, uh, somehow uh, assertive that um, in one or another they should find researchers should actually explicitly state how they can uh, the, the, the wearing of, of masks uh, is, is, it has become mandatory uh, or uh, actually uh, social distancing uh, become a, an important aspect of uh, research ethics and of, and of course uh, you know the use of uh, uh, zoom but uh, the, the, there's actually a challenge uh, on, on that one because of the effect that even if we are, we've got a very good uh, internet coverage in the country, uh, not everyone in Namibia has got access to, uh, for example, to the to devices which they can use to uh, access Zoom or Microsoft Teams and, and, and so forth. So this is actually some of the the, the, the challenges we've been experiencing um, with, uh, with, within the research undertaking at the, the University of Namibia. And even in terms of delivering teaching and learning at the university, not everyone. We have, we have 24,000 students. And of course, um, about, uh, let me say, uh, maybe 15 or 18,000 students do not have access to, to the mobile devices. So they, they can't access, um, uh, you know, um, uh, lessons by Zoom and, and, and so is, is research. There's actually one point that I wanted to mention, which we have experienced, uh, which we are actually experiencing from the research office, is the one of uh, omission. Um, you ex ex there, there are times that researchers, for example, explain how they are going to deal the, with ethical issues, how they are going to promote, you know, safeguarding in the field. But uh, when they go out there and undertake the research, they omit you know, some of the, um, uh, you know, considerations. They do something else, which was not actually stated 
in their original proposal. And uh, the bigger challenge we have is that we don't actually have resources to do a proper and adequate monitoring to ensure that uh, this is actually being, uh, you know, the, the way it's proposed in the research proposal or a concept not we call it now since the COVID, because it's usually a very short uh, proposal that they're giving, uh, not elongated one. So, uh, and there's, there are ethical considerations there. And of course, uh, if they, they, they omit uh, some of these uh, considerations, there's no way of uh, ensuring that uh, they've omitted some of these things. So it's actually uh, has been a challenge for, mm -hmm. from the research of us. Yeah. Yes. But, but you seem to, uh, you know, uh, truly, uh, you're becoming very resourceful. You're trying to deal with, with everything as best as you can. And um, yes, we had other speakers in, in the sessions in the se series. And, you know, there's obviously opportunities as well, one in seeing the problems and then to really appreciate the resourcefulness that our local partners have and, and relying mm. on that resourcefulness. Um, I realize that Alex needs... Yes, Sorry, can, I, can I just quickly make a, uh, a point on that? Uh, um, yes. Because just following on Professor Alex's and uh, Dr. Leona's comment, I think, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 thing has really brought into, um, into light uh, a couple of different points. Um, one of which on the idea or notion of moving research virtually, um, safeguarding and issues of safeguarding don't necessarily go away. Mm -hmm. um, in some instances, these can actually be magnified. The most obvious one, um, how would a researcher recruit potentially vulnerable participants, say for example, who are children, and interview them remotely via a computer? Mm -hmm. This can raise a whole panoply of, of quite complicated and legalistic issues with how can the research be done safely, ethically. And another thing which just very quickly, which we noticed as well, was whether it was done subconsciously or consciously, the idea that public health guidance in a particular country should or can be necessarily transposed onto another. So from discussions with researchers at all levels, when they're thinking through, well, okay, you know, how would this come to, uh, come to fruition? It was almost like the advice being given from Public Health England, oh, we'll just follow that in country X? Well, not necessarily, because country X may have a particularly different approach. Their, their, their category of people who are largely affected with SARS-CoV-2 may be different from the UK. So from, for a UK context, uh, you look at the biggest vulnerable group, it's median age 75 plus, and in particular within care homes. Now, specific public health guidance which would relate to that may not necessarily easily translate to a country in Africa or in the Far East. So it's, it's, sub, it's almost like a subconscious, we'll, we'll, we'll follow uh, the, the, the rules on social distancing, we'll follow the rules on masks, but is that necessarily a legal requirement? Is the public health guidance within uh, uh, a low and middle income country, is it identical to the UK? Have they taken a different approach? Mm -hmm. Are they managing their risks slightly differently? And I think SARS-CoV-2 has kind of uh, magnified or brought many of these issues into, into greater perspective as well. Just, and particularly with this idea of, you know, moving research um, online as opposed to in doing it in face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and I think these are very valuable points again, and I, I don't think we will think about it. We, we think of the safety of the people and we sort of uh, would tend to apply the same rules we apply here when we travel or when we find ourselves in different contexts. So again, I think it goes back to the point of working with the legal framework, understanding the policy framework, understanding the, the local government's response, the community's response, and again, it's all about consultation, right? And Leona made that point very well. Uh, dialogue, dialogue, and and Queco very, very at the very beginning, a dialogical, a consult, consultative approach to anything we do, both in understanding what safeguarding means and how we implement it. 
but also how we adapt in the, in the current era, we adapted in the current era. Um, I have to say that Alex Lewis, our director of research, has to leave. Uh, as far as I know, we don't have, we haven't received any questions. So I guess people are um, sort of digesting everything we're saying. There's a lot to think about. Uh, we have given the email. It's research at soas.ac.uk. Um, so we, we invite any questions, any afterthoughts, please do send them through. And I'm happy to share them with the panelists, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, and, and we can, you know, share them via Twitter, via our event page later on. Uh, and obviously this live stream will be archived, so we, you can rewatch re any time. So I want to thank you all. Uh, my apologies for running over, but it's been such an interesting and, and insightful discussion. And I will rewatch it myself to try and digest everything that was said. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, let's continue talking to each other. Uh, be safe and, and stay healthy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank bye. you. bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you to the viewers. Thank you. Thank you to the viewers.